the Evangels off the Pacific Ocean. Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be, across the nation, around the world. I'm George Norrie. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Open lines for you this hour. I'll give you the numbers in just a moment. Next hour, is it magic or extraordinary feats of the mind with guest Jim Carroll? Let me tell you, if you get up to the coasttocoastam.com website, just take a look at some of the things that Magician Jim has sent on to Lex that we've posted on the website I'm still trying to figure out how some of those things work. They're absolutely stunning. Well, about a week or so ago, Stan Dale was on the program. He was talking about a major earthquake that he envisioned near Honshu, Japan, off the coast there, the eastern coast of Japan. And sure enough, just moments ago, they had a 5.8 magnitude event. Now, Stan had thought it would be a bigger one and could create a tsunami. Now, this was 5.8. But is it a prelude of things to come? But uh, i got to say that was a hit for Stan Dale. Congress has sent President Bush a second five-week extension of the Patriot Act as Senate negotiators work to close a deal with the White House on renewing the anti-terrorism law with some new civil liberty protections for all of us. Well, they're saying, Alan Alan Spector is saying, we need the Patriot Act. I'm prepared to work on it further to improve it. He's the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Sixteen provisions of the 2001 law were to have expired last December 31st, but Congress extended them until Friday after Democrats and a handful of Senate Republicans demanded an avenue of appeals when the FBI makes demands for people's financial and other private records. The Senate voted 95 to 1 just moments ago to extend the current law unchanged through March 10th and give negotiators a little more time to reach a deal. The law makes it easier for federal agents to gather and share information in what they call terrorism investigations, install wiretaps, and conduct secret searches of households and businesses. At issue are 16 provisions that Congress wanted reviewed and renewed by the end of last year. I do hope that they bring in these new civil liberty protections because... Even in the act of trying to find terrorists, the Patriot Act could infringe on our rights. Two bombs exploded about 20 minutes apart in eastern Baghdad, killing at least 11 Iraqis, wounding dozens. Also sad news for us in the U.S. military. Five U.S. troops died in separate attacks. A roadside bomb blast killed three U.S. soldiers near south of Baghdad. A fourth soldier died the same day from wounds sustained in a small arms fire attack. And then a U.S. Marine was shot and killed during combat near the western city of Fallujah. In Russia, three bombs ripped through slot machine parlors in a southern Russian city, killing at least two people. Injuring up to 25 others there. They're treating the blast there as terrorism. Al-Qaeda is still plotting and preparing attacks on the United States, though great strides have been made to degrade the terror organization. Now, this all according to National Intelligence Director John Negroponte. He told the Senate panel this, speaking on behalf of the entire U.S. intelligence community in a very rare open session. He told the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence that Al-Qaeda and Iran are this nation's top security concerns. Although an attack, he says, using conventional explosives continues to be the most probable scenario, Al-Qaeda remains interested in acquiring chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear materials or weapons to attack the United States. Strange story out of the Bermuda Triangle. And this is starting to hit the mainstream media. There were three boats in the Bermuda Triangle. The first boat was a brand-new Mercury outboard with these engines. It was a brand-new boat. Now, that boat got further ahead of these other two that were in the Triangle. Ultimately, one of the stragglers had engine trouble. They radioed the lead boat and told them to hold up while they tried to fix the problem. Apparently, the person in the lead boat said that he would just idle and wait for them. It's very strange. A half hour later, they heard him yell, U.S. Coast Guard. They heard him say that twice, and then there was silence. Now, when the United States Coast Guard found that boat, it was empty. Only two of the three engines were running. The boat had two brand-new GPS recording systems 
Both of them were blank, no data. There were two 200-pound coolers on that boat that were missing. Two 200-pound coolers, gone. The food in the coolers was not taken. Steaks, shrimp, etc., thrown all over the boat. The guy was 45 years old, apparently in great shape, weighed about 200 pounds. He was a kickboxing champion. But this happened in the Bermuda Triangle. Al Bielek, you know him from the Philadelphia story, the Philadelphia experiment. 79, 80 years old. I've just found out that he has now suffered a second stroke. Happened a couple months ago, but I just found this out. We knew about the first one. He is home now. Uh, apparently, Al Bielek is in severe financial straits right now. I'm just going to give you their website, and you do with it as you may. Al Bielek, of course, has been just a great guest on Coast to Coast over the years, talking about that Philadelphia experiment and how the Navy tried to make a ship disappear. And he was on that, he says. www.philadelphia-experiment.com You can read up a little bit more about the plight of Al Bielek, and our prayers go out to him and wish him a speedy recovery. He's a tough guy. In New York, a man jumped to his death from the Empire State Building after buying a ticket to go to the observation deck. Now, he didn't go all the way up. He apparently jumped from a vacant office on the 66th floor of the 102-story building in Midtown Manhattan. More than 30 people have committed suicide at the Empire State Building since it opened in 1931. In Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, well, don't put those winter coats away just yet. The world's famous weather prognosticating groundhog awakened from his burrow at 7.23 a.m. Eastern Time. He saw his shadow, a sign that there'll be six more weeks of winter. But where is winter? Because people around the country are beginning to say, this is one of the most mild winters we've ever had. The balmy weather, though, they say, could soon end. But just how warm was January? Well, listen to this. Warmest on record in Oklahoma, South Dakota, Green Bay, Wisconsin, Kansas City, Missouri, Riverton, Wyoming, Epley Airfield in Omaha, Nebraska, barely missing the record in Iowa, second warmest in Maine and in Milwaukee, third warmest in Memphis, Tennessee, and in Detroit, fourth warmest in New York's Central Park area. That's tied with January of 1913 there. Very warm in Greensboro, North Carolina, and Louisville, Kentucky. Eighth warmest in Denver, the warmest since 1986. Tenth warmest winter in Baltimore. Warmest since 1950 in Buffalo and Nashville, Tennessee. Twelfth warmest in New Mexico. And Minneapolis, St. Paul had the warmest January in 160 years. Why? Well, they say the current warmth is caused by the very unusual position of the jet stream, the high-altitude river of air that flows west to east across the United States and North America. It divides warm air from cold. But they say over the coming week, the jet stream is expected to return to its usual wavy pattern, bringing real normal cold air to the eastern U.S. once again. And if they haven't had enough in New Orleans, tornadoes racing through New Orleans, many in the exact spots where a lot of the homes were destroyed. How much more can they take there? Water ice present on the surface of Comet Temple 1 suggest observations from NASA's Deep Impact Mission They say this is the first direct detection of exposed water ice on a comet. But the mission's science team says the water ice is presently in surprisingly small amounts, covering less than 1% of Comet Temple's surface. They are throwing out old assumptions about comets because they said they're just getting new data all the time. A strange story out of Ellensburg, Washington where Mel Waters is supposed to reside, you know, Mel's Hole. Well, first of all, let me tell you the strange story, and then an update on Mel and Mel's Hole. A man who owned three McDonald fast food franchises crashed his truck on Interstate 90 in Washington State. He climbed out, he took his clothes off, stood in a traffic lane, and was run over and killed. 35 years old, he owned three fast food restaurants, Apparently, he was doing very well, but uh, nobody knows what happened. I mean, it was freezing out. He took his clothes off and got hit by another vehicle. Now, to add mystery to all this, a dead dog was found near the truck. The dog's carcass 
straddle the two eastbound lanes near the shoulder of the road. Authorities haven't been able to figure out what was going on with that either. Now, you might remember back in 1997, Art Bell interviewed a fellow by the name of Mel Waters. Mel claims that there was almost an endless hole on his property near Ellensburg, Washington. As a matter of fact, it, uh, I did some of the calculations because I listened to part of the old interview that Art did with Mel. At least 15 miles deep. It had no end to it. That's about as far as Mel had measured it because he kept putting string down there with a one-pound piece of metal at the bottom of it to weigh it down. So at least 15 miles deep deep. I pulled out a little excerpt because I want you to hear this for a moment because there's now a major push underway to try to find that hole and to try to find Mel Waters. Listen to this portion of Art's interview with Mel Waters from 1997. This could be an apocryphal story, but one guy claims that he threw his uh, departed canine down into the hole. Oh, really? And uh, he swear. well, the story is the guy that did it swears the the dog actually came back to him, and uh, he was a really. Hunter. He was a hunt. Apparently, the story is that he was a hunter, and he was out there hunting, hunting, and he saw the same dog. He had the same collar. He had the same little uh, what is a little metal thing on his collar there, and uh, he said it was the same dog. And he says he knew he threw the dog into the hole. And well, that's, now, that's that's not you know that's not my dog <laughs> that's not my. It's you not know. your story, but it's it's uh, a story of a resurrected dog. Yeah, um, th- this is um, you know as you can well imagine, this is all uh, um, Native American land around here, and yeah, so one yeah, of the lines yeah. of inquiries I'd like to make is you know, uh, is there anything about this hole in regards to the Native Americans? Um, you know, that's that's something I haven't really pursued right now. But uh, If you had a fatal disease, Mel, yeah. would you jump in the hole? I would. You would? Uh, Just I, based actually, on the dog actually, story? It or? is in my will. What? Should I... <laughs> a classic, um, a simple classic. But there's a major effort underway to try to find Mel and the hole now. We're going to try to get behind it as well. I've received an email but by a fellow by the name of Grant. I'm not going to give you his last name yet, but he is a moderator of a website called melshole.com. He is a serious researcher. Since 1997, he says no one has been able to locate the hole or Mel Waters who obviously described the hole to Mr. Bell. Frankly, after dozens of searches, plus extensive research by many people, we're no closer to locating the hole when it first aired. Now, Grant is asking me to uh, check into some information here, which he hopes would allow him to try to track down Mel. So we will be working on that uh, in the not-too-distant future. We have re-emailed Grant and asked him to uh, make himself available to come on the program to see what else he's been up to in the search for Mel Waters and The Hole, which is one of the strangest stories I've ever heard. Now, we've got open lines for you. Here are the numbers. West of the Rockies, 800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 800-825-5033. First-time caller line, 818-501-4721. And the wild card line, get ready, 818-501-4109. I'm George Norrie, and this is Coast to Coast Day. Our next hour guest, Jim Carroll, the magician, was on the Jay Leno show, and we've got some audio which I'm going to play for you sometime next hour with Jim. Unbelievable stuff. Now, this this guy is good, but uh, I, I'll tell you, Jay Leno was in shock after he witnessed what Jim Carroll can do. So make sure that uh, you're listening very closely on that when I pay the, play that part of audio. Let's go to the phones. Wildcard Line, welcome to Coast to Coast. You're on the air with us. Hi there. Hello. Hello. Where are you? I'm in Colorado. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Yes, George. Uh, in 1998, I had a prophetic dream or out-of-body experience. You did? I'm a person who does not like heights. I don't even like to be in an airplane. But that night in 1998, I went to bed and found myself up above Oregon, the state. Now, what, what did it feel like? For a person who hates heights, 
What was it like to be way up there in the air? It was normal. I mean, it was it was natural. Did you feel free, like a bird? Um, I don't know. It was just a natural thing, and don't ask me why, but it was. And I have never had such a thing happen to me before. So I looked down, and all of Oregon was gone. It was completely covered with sand. I have never seen so much sand. And uh, there was not even one green leaf, tree, or car. You know how sometimes if there's been a flood, everything, you know, is all piled outside. Like nothing? No buildings? Nothing? No buildings. It was all covered up with sand. And... Um, there was only lines of water left. You know, it's just like after a big heavy rain, you see the, you know, lines of water left. Okay, um, I wasn't in any craft. You know how sometimes people say they, they're in a craft and right. they look down? I didn't see any of that. I just looked down, and there was all of this disaster. And uh, I don't have a clue how I got up there because I don't like heights. I, I thought to myself, and... Um, I thought, you know, everybody has always told people in California that they would be the next, you know, pe person that that had a problem in California. But no one ever prepared me for Oregon, and this is why it was so unusual. And both me and my husband, we thought it would be great if we could move to Oregon sometime. And then after I had that, I thought, forget it, I'm not going. Well, you think it was a futuristic dream, like hundreds of years away? Uh, I don't know. But all I'm saying is, I'm just warning people, and I feel sorry for prophets after that, because I know what they go through, because you want to explain it to people, and people do not believe it, and it wouldn't do any good to tell people. Sometimes people just won't listen. That's true. West of the Rockies, you're on Coast to Coast. It's your turn. Hi there. Hello, George. Seamus here. It's the voice of Seamus. <laughs> Long time no talk. The ghost chaser and the shadow man. How are uh, you, Seamus? What's going on? I was kind of wondering, uh, remember Prophet Jehovah, the guy that was going to summon those UFOs? That was Prophet Yahweh. Or Prophet Yahweh? Yes. Whatever in the world happened to him? Well, after we interviewed him a couple times, and uh, um, there was, as you know, a video from that Las Vegas television station that showed some object floating into the picture. That was strange. The good prophet uh, had problems getting anyone to back him or to have any more show up. So what he decided to do was to go on a worldwide tour for 45 days, and he was going to call on these UFOs to show up in every city, and I don't know what happened to him. Oh, well. But he's out there because every once in a while, I'll get an email from somebody who has heard about him or has read about him in their particular city. Well, so he's it. out there. It's like that movie, Radio Flyer, where yeah. that kid just sends in postcards from wherever he might be. Right. I think that's what's become of Prophet Yahweh. Well, keep us posted, George. Will he, do. He's an interesting character. Well, you put that mildly. Wild Card Line, you're on the air with us. Hi there. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is Mary from Cincinnati. Hello, Mary from Cincinnati. Uh-huh. Um, about a year ago, you had a doctor... Stephen Greer mm -hmm. uh, on about free energy. Yes. I haven't heard anything about it from now on ever since then. Well, you know, we, we bring a lot of people on, Mary, to talk about energy. Stephen Greer, one of them, what he's trying to do is to get this zero point energy. He, th he, he thought he was pretty close to finding the machine that was working and could do that as a demonstration. Uh, I guess maybe it's time to get an update from him just to see what he's been able to do. All right. Thank okay? you. You're interested in that stuff, huh? Yes. How come? Well, <laughs> for obvious reasons. You want free energy. Yeah. Well, Bill's pretty tight for you now? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. You're not, you're not alone on that, Mary. Okay. All right, thanks. Appreciate thanks. it. Hey, open lines are going to continue. If you need to email me, that's George at Coast2, T-O, coast coast com. Whenever you get a moment, get up to the coast coast com website, especially with our guest coming in next hour, Jim Carroll, the magician. Take a look at some of the mind-boggling things that he has sent our way. There's one there called the, 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 the Flash Numbers. I cannot figure it out. I'm getting close, I think. I think it has to do with some repetition of numbers. 
But this is, it's unbelievable. So if you have a computer, you're in luck. Get up to the coasttocoastam.com website. Take a look at it before we crash his server. I'll be back in a moment. Open lines continue right here on Coast to Coast AM. Red Elk knows a little bit about Mel's Hole. He visited it once. I think he said it was a volcano vent, if I can recall. Scott, by the way, a producer in Phoenix, Arizona, television producer, said he spent two days with Prophet Yahweh. He's, that's the guy who summons UFOs last summer. He said it was a big, fat, nothing, nothing happened at all. But he did go ghost hunting last weekend. Scott did, not Prophet Yahweh. And he said some awesome stuff happened. Scott, keep in touch with us. Let us know what happened when you went ghost hunting. If you have not seen the Predictions television show and you live in Canada, tonight was the big debut there. But don't worry, it's going to be on for another week. All you have to do is go to www.predictions.tv and it will guide you on where you can find the program. It is on cable right now in Canada and on satellite in Canada. And those of you in the United States that might have missed the show, you can look at it online by also going to predictions.tv. Let's go to the phones. Wild card line. Welcome to Coast to Coast. You're on the air. Hi there. Hello. Hi. Welcome to the show. Hey, George. Uh, I had a question for you. Um, I was wondering if you had any information or... uh if you knew anything about a dig they did in uh, Roswell, New Mexico, um, and it was an archaeological dig with scientists, and supposedly they, uh, you know, they dug up some stuff and um, they locked it up in a bank and they were going to take it out later and, and, and go over it. Now, was this on Discovery? Because when they went out to Roswell, they did an archaeological dig about two years ago. I, you know, I think that's. I think it was a couple of years. Yes, back. Yes, so. you are right. I was not. I did not know about the vaulting of whatever they might have found. I'm, okay. I'm not. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. But I know they went out there and took a look at it. So you're not sure if uh, the, what happened actually with what happened. Uh, you know, in the end, I don't think they found anything conclusive. Okay. Okay. And one one uh, one more question to add for you. Um, you had a caller um, who called in and. It was about like an assassination or something. I was wondering if you could comment on it. Um, it was in Grayling, Michigan. It was about two weeks ago. And apparently the guy's father was on his deathbed. And his uncle had uh, been involved in some assassination of some guy who was going to come out with some, uh, some information on, on UFOs. Very good. Next Friday, February 10th. Linda Moulton Howe, who is uh, talking to us that night that that individual called us, has had an opportunity to talk with him. He gave us his phone number. She's interviewed him, and we're going to play that interview next Friday night. Not this Friday, next Friday night. So she'll be on, and I'm glad you brought that up. Awesome. I'll listen. Thanks a lot, Okay, yeah. Make sure you are listening, because it is unbelievable. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with us. Hi there. Hi, George. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks. Um... Uh, I just wanted to comment on, um, I believe his name is Dr. Uh, Tory. Dr. Louis uh, Turry. Yes, Turry, I'm sorry, about the um, volcano prediction. And I was curious, you know, I tripped my friends out, because <laughs> my friends at work, because I told them about this volcano that would hit, and or I'm sorry, the earthquake that would hit. And Japan, and um, so they're going to really trip out when I tell them that it happened. Um, I was curious if they if there was any recent predictions that he's made. Well, yes, there are. As a matter of fact, he keeps talking about March thirteenth for something very, very big. So that's a couple months away. We'll have to oh. watch that. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay, and uh, don't forget, though, Stan Dale was the one who predicted this most recent Japanese earthquake. Wildcard Line, welcome to Coast to Coast. You're on the air with us. Hi there. Is this me? Yeah. Hi. Welcome to the show. Hi. Um, I'm trying to tell you not to do the interview with the devil. Not to do the interview? How come? Well, basically, he's been granted power, and uh, he can and will probably possess people, listeners, probably even yourself, because this is a... Something you don't want to get involved with. So you you think that if he is on the air, that he through his abilities would be able to possess people? Exactly. You don't think he could possess people now? 
they can only do what God allows them to do. But if you, it's like a, leaving the door open, you know, saying, hey, let people just come in, whatever. Well, we are taking we are taking some precautions. I, I, I will tell you that I'm not going into this thing blindly, at all. Um, I, I'm going to be surrounded uh, by someone uh, someone from the clergy um, and several staff people, and uh, we will perform the interview uh, in a sacred place, and uh, then uh, I'm going to attempt to record it. I obviously. I shall not do this live, nor do I think we have the capability of doing this live. Uh, so I'm taking all the necessary precautions to do that. Somebody sent me an email and said, George, you hate Ouija boards and you don't want to use them. Why interview the devil? I don't think you can control a Ouija board. Once you're playing with that planchette, anything can happen. Now, with the devil, well, this is just a QA. and a I mean, I want to know what things are like down there. I want to see... What his plans are, I want. I'm going to ask him who the Antichrist is. He may not answer, but we're going to take those precautions. I'm not worried about myself. Most of you are worried about me, but I am not. We'll be back in a moment. Coast to coast continues. And welcome back. East to the Rockies, your turn. Hi there. Hi, George. Hey, I'm glad you took my phone call. Today's my birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. And I said, God, let me get through this time. Okay, what does that make you? Let's see, your astrological sign would be, you're in change. Was that a Capricorn? No, I'm an Aquarius. Aquarius, okay. I'm called a water child. <laughs> and I love water. <laughs> see, it works. George, I have a question, and right. I would like to know if anyone out there has heard of this new product that's out, and it's made from zeolite, and I don't know if anybody... What does it do? Well, I have a friend that has cancer, and I told her about it, and I said, there's this new stuff out there, it's, called, it's made from zeolite, and that's like volcanic ash. You know, but there's different kinds of zeolite, but it's called natural cellular defense. Does it work? You know what? The lady's still alive. And <laughs> I ordered her two bottles, and I took it over there because she was supposed to be dead before Christmas. Oh, my. And hospice was in there. And so I called her, and I said, listen, I said, this stuff came in, and, and I'm going to, this was two days after Christmas. She was on um, you know, everything. Hospice was in, in her home. They were ready to she take her had, away. She uh, Yes. The doctors told her to go home and get her fares in order. This lady is still alive. She kicked them out after she was on it for <laughs> three days. She called me and she said, guess what? Hospice is gone, and I just made my bed and made my breakfast. Well, I think what are you, you doing? You, well, I tell you what you got to do. Let's uh, we'll do some Google searching. I have not heard of this, uh, and uh, you know we normally don't put those kinds of remedies on the air, but uh, it's well worth searching and checking into. And I'm glad she's going strong. A lot of it, though, could be her positive thinking too. If she believed it would work, uh, it might have worked. And happy birthday once again, Wildcard Line. You're on the air. Hello. Going once. Hello. There he is. Hi. Hello. This is Norm. I'm calling from uh, Elizabethtown, Kentucky. Hi, Norm. Um, my wife and I run teams um, in a truck. Uh, we run a lot of north-south routes. About a month ago, you were talking about uh, a lot of meteor showers and stuff like that. Sure. Well, we've taken the notice, and, and uh, we've noticed mostly in the southern states at night, we'll, you know, kind of we've got a contest going. Who's seen more? Um, three, four a night sometimes, and that's kind of unusual. Did you figure out if there we were in a belt or anything? Oh yeah, I think I think during that period, Norm, that might have been the Geminids at that time. Uh, you know, there's a couple big waves of meteor showers. There's the Leonids and the Geminids, but that's I think it was the the Geminids that that you were in, and okay. they well, are that's... spectacular, aren't they? Oh yeah, we've seen you know, and like I said, we. I'll get up from my shift and 
get ready to drive and she'll say, I saw four. How many do you see? You know, so it's, it's beautiful. It's just so many of them just kind of surprised us. Have you seen that phony television commercial on the Internet where this truck is bouncing along in the desert and a guy is videotaping it like his buddies and they're all waving to him from the truck and this meteor comes flying out of the sky and <laughs> blows up this area and the truck just keeps going. I get, you know, it's like a, a, a commercial for a truck company. It's not. It's never been aired on television. Maybe it's been aired in Europe. They do things like that. Yeah, I've... Uh... I'm not sure where I saw it. It might have been on the internet, but yeah, I've seen that. And the the, the pickup comes rolling out. It's even meteor proof or something like that. Oh yeah. uh, man, I would hate to be in a truck when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the call. Appreciate you being on the show. First time caller line. You're up on coast to coast. Hi there. Well, good morning, George. How are you? Good. Thank you. Good. Uh, that uh, actually, that truck commercial uh, has aired here on our local television. Oh, has it? Yeah, okay. yeah, it's really funny. <laughs> All right, then it's out there. Uh, absolutely. Hey, I just, uh, I, it's very intermittent that I get to hear your show because I'm never usually out this time of night, but I always try to catch it whenever I am. And this has been a few months ago, a couple of items that I heard that uh, was covered and just never heard any more about them. One, of course, was uh, the Giants of the Solomon Islands. The Giants and of the... Stephen Coyle updates us every once in a while on those. Nothing yeah. new to report. Nothing new Since there. you last heard that. And uh, then the last uh, the last time, I guess, was the, the fellow that was looking for, for Bigfoot. Ah, well, he hasn't found Bigfoot. That I can report. Okay. Well, he thought he had it. him. He thought he had him, but well, he I didn't. Know, uh, <laughs> it sounded like he was ready just to run right out and, and grab him and drag him I, into the I, studio. I know. For you. Abs well, I don't know if I'd let Bigfoot into the studio, but uh, <laughs> we'd p put him in the producer's booth. Oh, I see. There you go. But so, so no updates. You know, I just thought if, uh, I mean, as as matter of fact as these people sounded, you know, there's got to be uh, wealthy, uh, interested, uh, adventurous, eccentric, whatever you like to call folks out there that would have, man, if they thought they could get in on something like that, they'd have people all over well, the You would think that someone like that or a major television network, somebody would get behind a major documentary on the search for Bigfoot with the exclusive rights, you know, to do like they did in the King Kong movies, you know, to have the rights to just air this thing and, and, and all that. And that's not happening with Bigfoot. Yeah. I know just a fella. Yeah. Geraldo Rivera. Put him out there. Well, I don't know. Let's see. Geraldo went into Al Capone's booth. Nothing there, right? What else That's did correct. he do? Did, did he do the pyramids? Was he on that one? Oh, I don't think he was. All right. The only thing is... Somebody was right. with... Well, maybe... No, I think he was, wasn't he? With Zahi Hawass in Egypt? Hawass, yeah. Yeah, Hawass. That guy something. And I watched him the other night. He is high energy. Oh, golly. He does love what he's doing. I, I just wish he'd have... A little bit the better open mind about the fact that the Egyptians might have gotten some extraterrestrial help out there. Sure. All right, thanks. Absolutely. Hey, thanks, George. Appreciate you being on the program. Let's go to our East of the Rockies line. You're up. Hello. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Justin. I'm from Indiana. Hi, Justin. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, I have a question for you. It's like a dream that I had. Uh, I had this dream that I was like half awake and half asleep, and but my dream, like, you know how, like, whenever you have a dream, you have your eyes open and, like... You think you, it's like you're in the dream. You're, yeah. you're awake, you're doing your thing. And those, If you know, by the way, that you're in a dream, you know, you, you're, you're fully aware that it's a dream, but it's a dream. It's called right. lucid dreaming. And my eyes were open. Yeah. And I couldn't move, but I was trying to force myself awake. And I seen coming from the hallway, like, from what I've heard of what aliens look like, but I don't know if I've ever seen one unless this was real... And he had his arms coming out after me, but he was, like, maybe, like, three or four feet tall. And he had, like, a real big head, like, from, like, what I've heard of what aliens look like. How do you know you weren't really abducted? I don't know. Maybe it wasn't a dream. I mean... Maybe it happened. But then I, like, woke up, and then, like, it was it was gone. Well, yeah. wait a minute now. This is This is what some people who have been abducted say. They go through exactly what you went through. They don't have full recollection of everything that happened, right. all right, the abduction, and then they're back in their beds again or wherever they might be. Maybe that's what happened to you. 
Very, it's very. Like, it was kind of like a dream. I mean, he like had his oh, hands like out coming towards. Oh him. yeah, they're but they're always like dreams, and that's how it starts. But you know, if you really want to find out what happened to you, go to a hypnotherapist. You know, find one of those in your area. You said you're in Indiana, so uh, track one down. They might be able to help you. Next up, let's go to our wild card line. You're on the air with us. Hi there. Hi. Hello. Uh, this is Eric out in Missoula, Montana. Where it normally gets cold, but not anymore. Yeah, it ain't been too cold up here. No. But uh, um, I was wondering, uh, you were about a month ago talking about uh, that uh, uh, shoulder launch rocket that was uh, shot at a plane down there in L.A., and then we didn't hear nothing more about it. Well, that was only a report. Nobody ever confirmed it, and it didn't go any place. But there were reports that a pilot coming out of LAX saw something go by his plane, but nobody knows exactly what it was. So uh, uh-huh. the story died there, sadly enough. If it was a real story, they stepped on it and they quashed it. So that's what I was thinking. Um, and, of course, too, you know, the other thing I was going to say is uh, I've seen that uh, commercial for that pickup truck up here in Montana. So it's on television now, then? Yeah. Okay. I see. I saw it on the Internet first and thought it was just a spoof. So I guess it was a real commercial. Oh, yeah. It's hilarious. Dude. Yeah. It's one, of the, it's one of the better ones. Okay. Thanks. I'm, speaking of commercials, Super Bowl time Sunday. I wonder what they're going to play this time. People have spent, they, they, in production, spend more money to produce the commercials. I know some people at Anheuser-Busch, for example. They spend more money to make the commercials than they do to buy the time to air those things. And those events, and it's been going on for years, people (laughs) would rather watch the commercials than the actual game. And uh, that's the way it's been for a long, long time. Time for one more quick call. Hi there. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. I got a minute for you. It's all yours. Okay, a minute. Uh, hi, I'm Jack from Montreal. Uh, so, real quick, George, uh, the last five years, I know I'm being abducted. I can't believe I'm saying this. It took me so long to come out of this denial. My question, briefly, to you is: these pieces of metal and the scars that I have inside my body—that—that's like I feel like a tagged deer at this point. Um, what? Uh, what? What is this metal? Why do I have it? And uh, did you did you extract it, or, or is it still in your body? I'm going to tell you something. It's going to blow your mind away. I actually tried to take one of them out, and it flew back into my hands, man. They're there. You mean like a magnet? It went yeah, right back yeah. in? Yeah, and in front of a friend I did it, you know. I just took a knife, and I just said, you know, screw this, man. I'm like... Uh, okay, I'll tell you what you should do. I just had a guest on who could help you a lot. His name's Daryl Sims. Go to my website, coasttocoastam.com. On the left-hand side, look for show info and then guests. And then alphabetically, just look for Sims, S-I-M-S, Daryl Sims. That's his name. Email him. He'll follow up with you. He'll tell you all about these implants, what they mean. He may want to meet you. He definitely may find a doctor who might want to operate and take one of those out. Try that. Also, there's Dr. Roger Lear. Same way you can find him on, on, on the website. Somebody will help you, I'm sure. I'll be back in a moment. We've got a magician rolling. Boy, I love magic. But tonight, this is different. Very, very different. Our guest, Jim Carroll. And we're going to dive into the mind with some of some of his extraordinary feats. Back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. Jim Carroll began his career in entertainment. He began as a magician, and before he knew it, he found himself on the front page of newspapers all across the United States for correctly predicting the Pennsylvania lottery. Jim performed at colleges, universities, and was even invited to perform at the White House. He was then asked to tour the country with Guinness to promote their Millennium Edition Guinness book. The United States Playing Card Company then began sponsoring Jim, and together they developed a product called cool card tricks. It wasn't until a few years ago that Jim began to dabble with memory techniques and other feats of the mind, which then led Jim to realize that 
he has finally found his niche. Jim actually became addicted to memorizing things. We're going to test him a little bit tonight. Today, Jim is one of the most sought-after acts in the entertainment industry, combining extraordinary feats of the mind with comedy and Don't be surprised if you see Jim in the final table, by the way, the World Series of Poker or the World Poker Tour soon. We're going to find out about that. Jim, I want to make sure you didn't do a disappearing act on us. Hi, you're there, right? Yeah, I'm here, George. There you are. Good to talk with you. What a tremendous career you you have, and it's it's really, you know, got years and years to go. How did this all evolve for you? Wow. You know, it happened, uh, I used to actually work at Bethlehem Steel, I was a steel worker till the age of 30, and uh, I, I got I had a late start in the business. But the the big thing that really launched it was that lottery prediction that you talked about. Uh, like most of your guests that call in with dreams, yeah, that's what happened to me. You dreamt the lottery numbers? Oh, unbelievable! I, I I'm, I'm sleeping. Right, this is actually a true story. And the phone rings. I pick it up. I'm there. Hello. And the voice on the other end goes, Jim, you were right. The Pennsylvania daily number on December 22nd was 222. And then I woke up. I'm like, what the heck was that? You know. So I have a pad and pencil by my bed. I write this down, 222, December 22nd. And I went back to sleep. I wake up in the morning and didn't even realize I had the dream, walking around doing my thing. And when I went back to the where the pad was, I see this 222, two, two, December, what's this? And all of a sudden, bam, the dream came back to me. And so I, I encourage everybody, write your dreams down. Oh, my gosh, there's something to them, because this one really worked out. So what I did was every show from, this happened right around Thanksgiving back in 1990. Uh-huh. Every, every show that I did, I would hold up a, a sign at the end of my show, say, Merry Christmas from Jim Carroll. Play 222, two, two, December 22nd, and you will win. <laughs> I don't know why I did it. I just did it. Yeah. Know? Yeah, and then here, here's the, the the ironic part. December twenty second comes, and my wife's there. Don't forget to play the ticket. You got to play the number two. You know what I mean? So I go out, and there's a big line, a big line of people. I'm like, oh my god, I'm going to be late for the show. So I thought, ah, heck with it. So I went to my show, did my show, and then I come back home after the show, pick up the phone. You know how you have the voicemail? Yeah, and it has. You have 77 messages in your mailbox. Oh, like, my what? God. You know, usually seven. You have, yeah. You know? So I start playing the messages. You're not going to believe this. It's freaky. All of a sudden, the voice goes, Jim, you were right. The Pennsylvania daily number was 222. <laughs> the same voice as the dream. And it ended up being a gentleman. He was a chief of police at a township fire department that I did down there. So I started checking the messages, and here I found out 222 came up, and before you know it, newspapers are calling me. The National Enquirer is calling me. I'm finding myself on TV shows. and Incredible. So write your dreams down. Oh, my gosh. Well, before this happened, Jim, did you have this intuitiveness about you or this psychic ability about you? You know, I always had it and never really knew it. I guess everybody does. I think everybody has this. I think everybody has something in them. And when I used to work down at the steel mill, I discovered I could bend these spikes in my hands, with, with my bare hands, and I would give them to the general foreman. He'd hang them up on his door, and I don't know where that came from. I, I, you know, I wasn't really a strong guy, and so I always had different things happening all my life, but never really pursued the business of magic until afterwards, you know, until after the, the steel. When I got laid off, I had nothing else to do with well, my I, life. Yeah, I was going to say, is there still a steel mill out there in Bethlehem, <laughs> Pennsylvania? I had a well, friend of mine from the Navy. He used to work there, too, and I, I've lost touch with him. I don't know. I mean, our industry in this country is, is, is gone practically. Do they, still, do they still really have a functioning plant out there? Well, now, this is a rumor I heard. I don't know how true it is because I, don't, I no longer live in Pennsylvania, and it's ironic, all right? I pursued magic and poker and that's what i used to do at the steel mill i used to show tricks to the guys they called me magic you know i never did it professionally yeah and i used to play poker and stuff like that now i hear bethlehem steel is becoming a casino they could build a casino no. it's ironic. that's the rumor i heard i I'd like to know somebody, somebody will send us a message Unbelievable. We, we, we have instant messages here through fast blast we call it so, oh. somebody will tell us what's going on up there. that would be really ironic if that's true but well, yeah that's how seasoned were you when you dabbled in magic? I mean, were you David Copperfield like? Oh no way! Oh no way! I first of all, my dad loaned me some money when I got laid off at the steel, and I bought a. We we put a magic shop in the front of my house, 
It used to be a grocery store years and years. A ago. shop to sell things or to yeah, just play yeah. around? Just to play around and sell some stuff. All and right. Some, and I took a, a liking to it. I, up until this point, I have never done a show. And then uh, one thing led to another, and I really liked it. started reading books. And, you know, I, I had all the books at wholesale price. So I started reading and reading. I mean, thousands of books I've read. And then one day somebody comes in and offered me to, hey, why don't you do some tricks at our banquet, a Boy Scout banquet. We'll give you a, a donation. I said, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. so I went, say what? How much? <laughs> yeah, and I, I went up and did a show, and the guy gave me $35. Hey, being a laid-off steel worker back in, the, in, in that time. Oh, was, yeah. Like, you know, and that's what led me into this. And, and I, before you know it, I started doing a, a few colleges, and I had a wild look to me. I was a crazy guy from working at a steel mill, so they nicknamed me Madman of Magic. And so I took it up, and one thing led to another. And then after the lottery prediction, they nicknamed me Psychic Madman. I'm not a psychic, and I'm not really a madman, but it fit, and it worked all these years, and here I am. Yeah, I'm going to talk with you tonight about two different areas. One is, of course, magic, the kind of magic all of us have seen on television and really have grown up with since we were kids. And then there is this mental magic that you perform, Jim, which is truly amazing, which uh, I want to talk with you about as well. How much of it is, is sleight of hand and illusion? Well, I like to, what I do is, is some sleight of hand, and uh, I call it sleight of mind. I, I like to play with people's minds and things like that. I, I have a pretty good memory that I developed, especially the last couple of years. And we could get into that, but uh, I like to call it like magic of the mind. I'm not like a David David Copperfield. He's the best with the big illusions yeah. and things like that. I like the I like the one on one type of magic with a small group of people, and uh, like most of my college shows, you know, it, it, they range from like 50 people up to like 500 people, and uh, that's kind of what I do. Well, well, how how can a magician? Wasn't it Copperfield who made? A 747 disappear? Yeah, he did a little. I mean, how do they do that? Statue of Liberty, everything's an illusion. It's, a, it's an illusion. And uh, that's the fun part, trying to figure out how it's done. See, once you know how to do it, it's no fun anymore. <laughs> it's always a trick, though, right? But, well, well, the magicians are, are tricks. Yeah. Some of the, the mentalists, it's a little different. You know, some of them aren't tricks. Some of the stuff they do are pretty unique. It's, how, how many mentalists plant a friend in the crowd? Well, be honest. <laughs> <laughs> You're putting me on the spot here. Well, you know, some people might do that. I mean, you know, there are, there are mentalists that are magicians, but there are also some guys that do some stuff that are that's pretty amazing. Oh, you know, some of the people I've met in the college market, God, they they do things I don't even know how they're doing it. So that, that's what it's like. It's all up to the individual to try to figure it out. Is it is it an illusion? Is it scientific? Is it supernatural? And did you get better? As the years went by, well, yeah, every every year it's the crowds are getting bigger, the the, the, the college I'm getting more and more shows, and and since I started dabbling with the mind, the the memory stuff, oh my gosh, everything's going nuts here, and I started training a couple of younger people, they're in their twenties, and they, they they graduated from Penn State when I entertained at their college, and now I added them to the show, and it's just becoming a huge show, and we call it Mind Magic and Madness. And it's, I want to jump ahead for a moment. You were on the Jay Leno show, and oh, I've got a little clip of audio I want to play, but I want you to set it up, Jim. This had to do with, of course, a, a trap <sighs> and, and a glass bottle. Tell us a little bit about what we're going to hear. Obviously, I wish we could all see it, but what are we going to hear? Well, it's actually something stupid. I, I, I put my hand years and years in this fox trap, and... I got a call about appearing on a Tonight Show. So I told them I got a bigger trap, <laughs> and I never had put my hand in this bear trap up until that point. And it's a big bear trap. It's a, I mean, you can see it on your link to my website. I think there might even be a video. Okay. But, but, and you get, we put it on a Tonight Show. When Jay put goggles on. I had goggles. The whole audience has plastic holding up because we put a beer bottle in the trap. And it's just, pew, it shattered it in the middle. You know, just to show the authenticity of the trap. And then Jay said, well, what are you going to do now, Jim? I said, well, Jay, I'm going to attempt to put my fingers in there. <laughs> and that's what I did. And that was the actual, the actual first time I've ever attempted it. I mean, I, I tried it at home with a, with a big, heavy glove on, and it hurt like heck. So I thought, after the Tonight Show, I'm going to take the glove off, and bam, I stuck my hand in the thing. And, and now, the power of, I call it the power of positive thinking, the power of the mind, and 
Now I know it can't hurt me, so I do it at every show now. All right, this was not a trick. No, the bear trap is not a trick. This whatsoever. was not a trick. Okay, let's do that. And, 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 and hopefully we use these traps for magic and, and, and for what you just did. Do they still use them on animals around this country? Oh, the poor animals. I, I, yeah, I, would, I would hope they would stop doing that. But, but let's listen to this clip from the Jay Leno show. This is Jim Carroll now. He has uh, got this trap. He puts a bottle in it to, to test it. And then he puts his arm in there. Jim Carroll, Jim Raya, Jim, come on out here. Okay, just to show it's a real trap. And, and you haven't changed the tension of the spring, right? No. This is the real... This is, I've never even done it before barehanded. We're going to try it. You're going to try it? Yeah, we'll try it. Here we go. All right, here we go. Out! All right, okay. All right, there you go. Okay. Might be careful. One, two... Man, I can't. Oh, now oh, you're my oh, oh, you're... <laughs> you're right? I'm fine. Oh, Jim, I'm still grimacing in pain. Oh, jeez. He got his fingers caught in when he was trying to get it off me. So he knew it was real. Oh, my. Did it hurt at all? <laughs> oh, my gosh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be. I'm not going to lie about it. It hurts. But it didn't snap your hand off. No, not so far. Should it have? If you didn't have this powerful thinking, what should have happened to you? I don't know. You, you know, I, I had some. I had a lot of medical people examine me and stuff, and they're wondering. You have all these little bones and tendons. Why it doesn't do any damage? I don't know. I, I have no explanation for how I do that. I really don't, George. Well, have you morphed then from being just a magician into someone who truly is using your mind to do some incredible things? Yeah, that's what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm more into the mind now. I, I, I kind of like. Well, one of the things I got into now is the poor guy that I'm training, he does things even more dangerous than I do. Now, he, he, does, he stands on broken glass with his bare feet, jumps up in the air, and does a backflip and lands on the glass, oh. proving that pain is all in your mind. So we do. The show is called Extraordinary Feats of the Mind because it, it dabbles with the memory, how to uh, play with minds and have fun with it. That's what my book is called, 50 Ways to Hustle Your Friends. And then, and then, it, and then it, and it goes all the way down to the, to the level of pain control with the mind. Now, what do you mean you're training someone? Well, his name... You got an assistant? Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, his name is Chris Chelko. He, I was performing at Penn State University, and he approached me with his friend Michael Dubois, and they, they were seniors, and they said, Hey, we'd like to do this for a living. You're really cool. And this and that. And I said, Well, you know, well, what do you guys do? And, it, you know... He gets his, takes off his socks and shoes and dumps all these broken bottles on the ground and starts walking on them. I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. I said, but, you know, I travel around the world with the Guinness Book of Records, and there's a number of guys that do that. I said, you're going to have to do something more than that. His buddy Mike jumps up on his shoulder, stands on his shoulders, George, wow. while he's standing on the glass and starts juggling machetes over his head. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. So I said, yep, you guys are going to come on a row with me. I'll take you on a row. Then, and within six months, I had them on The Tonight Show doing that. So that's kind of what we do now. It's a very unique. The whole show is about the mind, and it's, it's just crazy. It's, it's incredible what your mind can do if you really study. And it's, Does the glass pierce the skin at all? <laughs> You've got to ask him that. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how he does it. I, I, you know, I'm the guy that's into the pain control, but, dude, I, just could, I could never stand on that glass. Did you even try? Nah, I don't. I don't even want to. You won't even that. go there. No, no. no. That's that's something that you can see. I have to think positive, and I'm 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 very negative about it. I'm well, in the minute you doubt it, yeah. Exactly. Oh, I could just feel stepping on that. I know it's going to go right through you. Yeah, just like it. Yeah, I I feel like it's it's all positive thinking when when it comes to the pain control stuff. What do you think is out there in the universe, Jim, that allows you to do what you do? I don't know. I'm trying to discover that myself right now, and that's why I listen to your show every week. Sooner or later, I'm going to get the answer. <laughs> but see, that's that's what's so fascinating. I mean, you really are innocent with all this. Yeah, I don't know what. Well, you know, like I said, it, it, like with that dream I had, I don't know where that came from. You know, telling me to play this, and then and then well, the one th the one time I'm doing a show in Buffalo. Now, this this definitely this story fits your show. I'm driving home from the show from Buffalo. All right. 
And and I, I lived in Allentown, Pennsylvania at the time. You know, living here in Allentown, yeah. like the Billy Joel song. That's what my life's like. And and I'm driving down this interstate. I, I think it was 390 or something. And I see this sign. It's about one in the morning, and it says Corning, 70 miles. And Corning's my halfway home point. And I'm like, okay. All of a sudden, it's getting really foggy, really super foggy. And you know how you have the little white lines on the road. Where, you know, where people yeah. pass you, I couldn't even barely see. I'm like looking out the side of the window. I could barely see these lines. It's getting so funny. I got, all of a sudden, I'm like getting tired and everything. And I thought, maybe, maybe I should pull over, all right? Then all of a sudden, it's like dawn. I'm like, what is going on here? And I see a sign that says Corning, two miles. And it's, I look at my clock. It's five in the morning. You lost four hours. Yeah, I swear. True story. I don't know what that was. You were abducted. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Man, who knows? But ever since then, that's when I really, really, it seems like my whole career took off. So maybe something happened. I don't know. <laughs> well, but, you know, the, the, what was that John Travolta movie where he got hit by a beam of light? Oh, yeah. Phenomenon. Phenomenon. Yeah. yeah uh, did that any, a tragic anything ending like that happen to you? <laughs> yeah, it did have a tragic ending. So it doesn't happen for you. But, I mean, yeah. did anything like that ever happen? Did you get hit by lightning no, or anything? No, nothing like that. The, the, like I said, the, the most mysterious thing that ever occurred was besides the dream, was that trip home, and I'll never forget that. And, and you know what? And it's, it's ironic. I ended up moving to central New York, you know, upstate New York. Like, what, does something compel me to, live, to move up here or what? I, don't I, know. I had a, a truck driver called us a couple of weeks ago, and we were just talking about things, and he had lost time for 150 miles. He was driving a truck, which I think had, like, some kind of fuel on it, a tanker truck, and he said, George, I can't remember 150 miles. Wow. Now, that's a pretty long way to be driving and not remember anything. I'd like to know what's up with all this stuff because it happened to me, and, and I, I'm about the most honest guy you're ever going to talk to. I would believe me that something went on there, and I don't know what it is. And, and now, all of a sudden, I go from Bethlehem Steel worker to and, and, and my high school, George. Let me tell you something. I, I, I failed chemistry, all right? I didn't do well in high school, and now I do lectures across the country for corporations and college students and professors, and I don't know what happened all of a sudden. And now, like, I, I made a bet with a guy about the periodic table of elements. Now, once again, I flunked chemistry. Back then, I'm lucky if I knew three of them. <laughs> now I memorized the whole thing in 44, 45 minutes, never forgot it. That's amazing. I don't know what's happening. Let, let's test your memory a little bit when we come back. Can we do that, Jim? Okay, George. We'll do that. Jim Carroll, our guest tonight. Later on, we'll open up the phone lines. This is uh, pretty fascinating stuff, so get your questions ready later. We'll be back. Well, we've got some information on Bethlehem Steel. Tony, I won't give you his last name, but he is the Director of Community and Economic Development out there for the city of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He wanted to confirm that a casino is indeed being proposed for a portion of what was the former Bethlehem Steel plant. And the Las Vegas-based Venetian is developing the program. So that could very well happen. We'll be back in a moment with our guest Jim Carroll on Coast to Coast AM. Jim's website, by the way, is mindwizwiz.com, linked up at coasttocoastam.com. Well, there you have it, Jim. If things work out, a part of the plant will be turned into a casino out there. Amazing. That is amazing. I mean, here I leave the plant, and I could end up coming back down one day to perform at this casino or, or do a poker tournament. <laughs> it's incredible. That, yeah, that could be. Tell me a little bit. Now, the strength of what you do now is what? All mind? Yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of energy. Uh, I don't, I don't know where it comes from. Like I said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I start doing this show, and all of a sudden, this energy just flows from my. I, I become like this crazy guy on stage, throwing stuff around, and and then I have like, uh, like I said, I develop this ability to like, I don't know, just read people. I can like kind of tell when they lie, when they tell the truth. I think it's, it comes from cramming my mind with this memory stuff. I mean, you have to see me. I'm on the exercise bike. And I'm looking through flashcards and, you know, of Hall of Famers in the Baseball Hall of Fame, the Football Hall of Fame, words in the Scrabble Dictionary, World Series, Super Bowl. Oh, and it's just crazy what I got going on. And I keep, 
it's like I got addicted to this. I got to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And the more I do it, the more powerful my my mind gets. And it's like it's it's, it's getting scary right now. The, the the intuition is is getting really scary. Has it saved you from any bad situations? Yeah, on a lot of it. First of all, this is my livelihood now. Oh my God, I don't know what I'd be doing if I wasn't entertaining. Jeez, that's yeah, that's true. Not alone, it's that's scary all by itself, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, but the but the memory stuff, George. I don't know how it's happening because, like I said, I, I like to the people who even nickname me. Like, I'm like Rocky Balboa mixed with Rain Man, <laughs> like <laughs> like because I because I come from like yeah, I'm a regular guy. Come on, I worked at a steel mill. I yeah, I was a regular average, probably a below average student, and I went to to the, the local community college and couldn't handle that. I was a criminal justice major, and. I don't know. I, maybe maybe things just spark later in life. I don't know what happened, but but all of a sudden, my, I'm like becoming this memory fanatic. It's, I mean, you should see. I'm up till I'm up till four or five o'clock in the morning every night. I listen to your show, and I, as I'm listening to the show, this is when I'm home. I'm looking at flashcards until I fall asleep. You know, it's like I can't I can't stop doing it. I don't know what's going on. You're obsessed by it. Yeah, I'm actually obsessed by memorizing lists of things. All right. I mean, so how can I throw you through a quick little test here? Well, you, well, what's out there? What do you do? I throw uh, well, like could, zip codes at you, I, or tell me a zip code, and then you'll tell me the city. Well, sometimes I, I don't have all of them memorized. But what if I tell you the city? You tell me the zip code. No, I do it the other way around. All right. So, yeah. Okay. Um, four eight one two five. It, now, instantly, when you say four eight, I know it's it's. I know the general vicinity. It's like right around. Is that? Is it like Dearborn Heights? Yep. I think it's called. Yeah, yep. Are you serious? Yeah, I got that one. Yeah. See, some sometimes I miss the little towns. The little towns are really tough. It's like, like I, most of the people, I'd say like 75, 80% of the people in the country live in a big city. And that's, you know, you study the big cities and then you study the surrounding towns and, and it's, uh. And I, and I gotta tell you, you're faster than, you know, some people are probably saying, all right, he's sitting by his computer. He's yeah, like, I know. No, but you're, you're faster than that. That's you're, why I like to do it in person. Like most of the stuff, like the hardest thing to learn, the most ironic thing was when I was learning the countries and the capitals, because there are several hundred countries, all right? And I, I put them on the flashcards. This is a true story, once again. And I'm like, I, I go through them in my mind once, once or twice, and, and then I, I went to sleep. And then I, I'm sleeping, and I'm, I'm dreaming that I'm reading the flashcards. <laughs> Honest to God. And I wake up, and I had them memorized. And that really blew my mind away. Is that, I like to talk to some kind of psychologist or medical. You know, is that possible? Or I don't know what happened there. So, yeah, the mind is very unique. The human mind is incredible. Oh, my God. I wish I wish I would have been educated when I was younger to know how the heck I'm doing half the stuff I'm doing. 63017. Six, that's out in Chicago, maybe near Chicago. It's, it's Chesterfield, Missouri. Yeah, yeah. Is that Missouri? Yes. Wow, you got me stumped. I, I thought that was Chicago. 63017. Six, yeah. See, like I said, I don't know all of them. I know about maybe, like, maybe uh, 90... 90%. Well, how many are there? I don't even know. Maybe I, are there a hundred thousand? It's got to be. Yeah, got to be. Yeah. And then another thing I got like is the like the Super Bowl scores. I I, I was always into it. With Super Bowl right around the corner. Do you predict you know. scores? Yeah, you know what I I, I do. I, I predict I predict stuff, and yeah, sometimes it comes true. Sometimes it don't. Like at the beginning of the year, I told everybody to the Steelers and the Bears. Eh, the Bears let me down. <laughs> I predicted the Steelers and the Bears in the Super Bowl. And the Bears didn't make it, but the Steelers... Steelers you know, did. The Steelers did. But, hey, the Bears, they... Strong they, team. They shocked a lot of people. Strong team. So, yeah, I'm pretty good with the sports. You know, I, I follow sports, and, and you know, I, like I said, I memorize all the scores. Like, you can name a Super Bowl and tell you who won, what the score was, and stuff like that. But, yeah. Can or, you... or the fo pro football players, like the whole Hall of Fame. I, I sit back down and memorize people's names in the Hall of Fames, and, and that's pretty easy. Because everything has like a ring to it. Like I, I, I associate things with with a celebrity. This is how I do it. I'm going to tell you. I like celebrity names. I have the first. I, I started by memorizing. This is going to sound weird. I, I memorized a list of a hundred celebrity names. I like Tom Cruise. Yeah, like Tom Cruise was 15th on my list. All right. Like I have names, and this is how I taught Chris, the other guy, and Mike. All right. You start with the celebrities, and then I link other things to the celebrities. Like with a little funny picture, like like uh like Tom Cruise. Say I want to remember the Bahamas. 
I linked Tom Cruise to the Bahamas. I visualized cruising the Bahamas. And, and this is what I did. I, I put this whole thing together, and it's like so bizarre. And then, then it turns from 100 celebrities to 1,000 celebrities, and I got all these baseball players, football players. And that was confusing enough. And then when I started throwing numbers in the mix, like started like memorizing pi, oh, my gosh, that is really hard to try to memorize pi because you can't associate it with anything. You just got to rattle them off. So I started trying to memorize pi. And then I'm at a school, at University of Rochester, and I bump into this college student, and he has like two or three thousand digits of pi memorized. So I'm like, what the, how, how could you possibly know that? Who has it? that? I thought I had a boring life. God, and, you know, <laughs> like I, I was up to like a couple hundred digits, and when I seen this kid had that many, I stopped. I thought I'm not going to pursue this anymore because I'll never even catch that guy. So. So I'm, it's, it's a phenomenal thing, the mind, I'm telling you. Now, now why do you try to remem- memorize all this stuff? I have no idea. It's just something I started, and, and like I said, I, I'm, I'm like addicted to it. And it's a good thing to be addicted to, and who knows, maybe it, maybe it could... How about keep... mathematical numbers, Jim? I okay. mean, if I said uh, 825 times 130... Well, I mean... now you've got to talk to my good buddy, Scott Flansberg. <laughs> so he does that. Oh, Scott is the best in the business. Scott... Scott's known as the human calculator. Oh, yeah, I talked to him years ago. Yeah. All right. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. yes. Well, he's one, he's one of my good buddies. And see, like, he does, you know how he, like, if you could name a date, and Scott will tell you the day of the week it fell on, because he does it with a mathematical formula really fast in his head. Now, what I did was I memorized all the dates of all the days in a week, like all the way back to almost like 1 AD. Like, you could name a date, and I'd tell you what day of the week it fell on. Okay, no, I, let, I, let, let, let me uh, let I, me just throw one. Um, like your birth date or anything. De- yeah. December 7, 1941. What day was that? 40, 41 is a 2, so December 7th, that's a, that's a Sunday. It was a Sunday. All yeah. Right. See, now Scott is faster than me, but he does it mathematically where I have to memorize all this stuff. Because he, he even told me, he goes, what are you crazy trying to memorize all these dates? There's a simple formula. And he started doing this thing now, he calls it, where everybody, all your listeners, you, me, everybody, can become a human calendar. He has a, a, a new calendar system he's developing now where everybody can do this, and I'm anxious to see what that's going to turn out to be like, because I know how that took me a long time to memorize all those dates, and for him, it's just, boom, he just rattles them out. He just, I don't know how he does it. I'd rather just go to my wall and look at the old calendar. I'm telling you, shit. <laughs> but this is, this is what it's like, George. It's a, it's a, strange, it's a strange thing that... that and then you bump into these strange people like that, you know, that they have talents as well with this. Have you ever had your mind, uh, your, your brain checked, no, scanned? I'd be, I'd be interested in doing that. I bet it's, uh, I bet if, if a doctor looked at it, he'd say, this is an electronically active brain. Wow. You must have electrodes buzzing all over the place. I don't know. Maybe that's why I don't go to sleep. I, 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 you know, I, I that could be. Yeah, I'm constantly up. And, you know, even when I go to sleep, I, I won't sleep long. What I'm really fascinated in is your ability of intuition, because this is something I think we all have. A lot of people don't act on it. A lot of people can't perfect it. But intuition, I think, is a part of us. It's, it's, it's a mechanism that allows us to do some incredible things. It saved my life one day when I was going through a uh, red light, a green light. I stopped because I didn't want to go anymore. I just felt strange. I thought somebody, something was going to happen. Sure enough, had I continued... I would have been rammed because a guy went through his red light. Unbelievable. Now, that's, that's intuition, and that's how it kicks in at its best. Do you do things like that? Yeah, well, that happened. something similar happened to me. I was, I was driving to a college in Connecticut to do a show, and there's this truck in front of me, like a pickup truck, and he had one of those trailers with a tractor on it or something. Yeah. And I see it bouncing around, wobbling, and all of a sudden, something's telling me, like, yo, something's going to happen. And the last minute, I turned to go into the other lane, and don't the trailer go flying off, boom, 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 hitting the guardrail? Mm. That, if, if that, I don't know, is that intuition? <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but, so yeah, kind of similar to yours. And, and in my show, what I do is, is I kind of like incorporate that in the show where, where I get somebody up on stage and I like get 10 people, give somebody a $100 bill, and the person that comes up on stage, I give them five chances to pick a person. And they pick a person. If they could pick the person that has the $100 bill, they get to keep it. And nobody ever won yet. 
That's what, I, and what I do is I kind of like. And they got a twenty percent chance, don't they? Yeah, yeah. But I kind of like gotcha. force your decision on things. I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very good at that. Figure, like if, like if I walk around a dining hall at a college, I could kind of tell like who likes you, who don't like you, you know, who thinks, hey, get out of here, get lost, bald headed. Really, guy. You, yeah. you, you can, you can tell that. I, I'm telling you, it's just getting stronger and stronger by the year, especially with the lying. Oh my God, you cannot lie to me. My kids hate me. <laughs> I'm telling you, can, they well, can't. Do lie. you look at something? The eyes. I look in your eyes, and, and it's the eyes and the facial expressions and, and you know, different twitches. And you know, Don't get me wrong. I'm not 100% accurate, but probably a good 90, a high, a high 90 percentile. And, and so I created this, this thing in the show, and I call it Jim Carroll's lie detector chair, the truth chair. And what I do is I get somebody to sit on a chair. I mean, that's like the, everybody goes hysterical over this trick. And, and I, I kind of look in their eyes. I said, look in my eyes. You're going to get a shock on your butt if you tell a lie. You know? and, and the kids ask them questions. And if they tell a lie, bam, they hop off the chair. It's just phenomenal. That is like, and so that's how I, that's how I incorporate the, the intuition in, in the show and the influencing the thought and stuff like that, I call it. But like I said, I just, I'm, all, I'm all about having fun. And it's, it's, a, it's a great time. And, and, but the, like I said, it's all the mind is so powerful. It's just people, you know, you could, you, well, you know, gosh, you know, oh, yeah. this is the mind is so powerful. It's amazing what the human mind can do. Can you teach people to have a better uh, intuition or that's, better memory? That's what I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to, I'm teaching these two guys. I taught my little boy, but, uh, like I was on Rosie O'Donnell's show a long time ago and my, my little boy was only, what well, was only six or seven. And he did some stuff like that over the over the telephone with her, and but he doesn't want to travel, and I don't want to force him. So that's why I train. Oh yeah, he's just a little guy. Yeah, yeah that's why I train these two guys. And so yeah, it can be taught. I'm teaching that, and the, even the memory stuff can be taught to, to how to improve your memory skills. <laughs> I remember a friend of mine was watching television, and up popped on the TV some uh, some tapes on how to improve your memory, and she got all excited because she's got a horrible memory. And, uh, you know, they flashed this toll-free number, and she got disappointed because she forgot the number. <laughs> <laughs> and never, and never ordered the tapes. That's incredible. Uh, yeah. of, of everything that you've done in your career, what stands out right now for you? As far as my, my big high or yeah. big moment? That just happened recently. It, 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 uh, I did a, my, my wife, she, she loves Aerosmith. She loves the band Aerosmith sure. and Steven Tyler. And her big dream was, oh, she would love to meet him one day. Yeah, dream on, like the song goes. <laughs> That's never going to happen, right? And I had two people that I knew, really good friends of mine in Boston, and they, they, uh, they hooked me up with a, to do a show at, at a private restaurant down there, and uh, he's affiliated with the restaurant. And I'm doing my show, and who pops in but, but Stephen Tyler? All right. See, how about that for synchronicity? Uh, I'm huh? telling you, it's, I, I call it good karma or yeah. something. I don't know what and, it is. And as you know, no coincidences out no. there. I'm telling you, this is, that's ironic. That, what are the chances, with it, especially with him touring and yep. everything else? And so he's there, and he's watching my show. And my wife's, he's standing right behind my wife, and my wife didn't even know it. Oh, my gosh. So he watched my whole show. I seen him standing there, and then he even had his hands over his face so I wouldn't pick on him and stuff like that. And then <laughs> after, the, after the show was over... They introduced me to him and my wife and took a, taking pictures and hanging out with us for about an hour. Coolest guy in the world. Oh, my God. So that was probably the big high in my life so far because... You made I, her happy. I made my wife. Yeah. That, that was giving Good her the best, the best Christmas present she could have had. Good for you. So, man, that's kind of... Oh, all right, do, do a little opening for us. Uh, it, but keep in mind, this is radio, so we're going to have to visualize this and, and you. But, you know, let's say you come out on stage. What do we expect here? Well, I started off with a little magic, all right? I do this routine called Star Trek that I created about 20 years ago. And uh, someone holds uh, two uh, cantaloupes or two honeydew melons or whatever, all right? And I have this big, giant deck of cards, not a regular deck of cards. And then one person is Mr. Spock or Captain Kirk, mm -hmm. and, and the other one's a planet. And depending on what planet they name, it could be funny, you know? And then, then the, the person with the melons is a Klingon warship. <laughs> And I started every show like this for 20 years, George. It's incredible. And what happens is it's a lot of funny bits, you know. They, they rotate around the planet. With the, she walks around with the two melons. And, I'm sure you play with the melons. Yeah, it's a good. It, it, there's a lot of good jokes here. And, yeah. and then so, 
So what happens is the, the other person who is Mr. Spock picks a big jumbo card, any card they want. They rip it up in pieces and keep one of the pieces in their hand. Okay. Then I say, what's going to happen right now is you're going to beam that card into the planet, all right, the balloon. It's a big balloon that the guy's holding. Mm-hmm. And then I tell them to make a noise. They go, beep, 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 and whatever. It's, it's really funny because you got these old corporate people going, making beeping sounds, and people want, it's so funny. And then... These are people who fire people, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, heads roll in the corporate market if you don't go over well. So, yeah. So, so to make a long story short, the, the card does not appear in the planet like I expected. I'm like, oh, darn. I said, well, maybe your aim was off. Maybe you beamed into the, one of the Klingon warships, and they pick one of the melons, all right? Then I pull out this big, giant knife, and I do some by-play with the knife where I make it look like it goes in my arm. And yeah. It's really funny looking and stuff. And then to make a long story short, when I cut the melon open, there's this big jumbo card inside with a piece missing. And then when they match the piece of it, match there the it is. Yeah, that's called my Star Trek. I, that's I, pretty good. Twenty years I've been doing now. That. I gotta believe w- there's no card in the melon. You somehow sleight of hand <laughs> got that thing in there. Actually, I think they're grown like that with the card in. I don't know. <laughs> with with the advent of television and digital television, and and the ability now to look at things frame by frame. Can they videotape you? You know, let's let's say when you're on Leno's show or a television show and you're doing a magic trick. Right. Can an editor, if he wanted to find out what you're doing, can he go back there and look at this frame by frame, and will he see what you're doing? Yeah, you know, some some things you might, but nah, most of the stuff you won't. I mean, I, I let people videotape my shows all the time. I don't care. Let them replay. And they still can't find it. They nah, still can't. You won't, that, not for that, you won't. That what you won't discover. And the bear trap, obviously, is real. And, and a lot of the the mind stuff that I do with the, the young guy, Chris, that I trained, nobody has figured that out yet. That's taken in the country by storm. We, we, we came up with this thing. Oh, my God. Are you in a church, by the way? No, that's my clock. Oh. I thought this was the. I thought you were watching a Christmas Carol with Scrooge or something. It no. sounded like that. It's three a.m. Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> that means, no, that's, that's, that's a like, big clock. Yeah, it is. It's a big grandfather clock. But but um, yeah. So it's the, the, the two person mind thing that I do is, is kind of like a telepathic thing, and and nobody could figure it out. I mean, the best minds, the best magicians, the sharpest minds in these colleges, no one till today has figured it out. We came up with this about. A few months ago, and it's the most powerful thing that I do. Can right you now. do any mind tricks with callers? Does you, that work at all? Well, you know what we could do. I could actually teach. I could teach you and your callers a trick or two. Okay. If they want, from my book, I'll teach you right after this. Do you want us to open up the phone lines now? Yeah. All right, we'll do that. We'll be back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And our special guest tonight is entertainer, magician, mind man Jim Carroll. And we'll be back. We'll take your phone calls. We'll continue chatting with them about how to build on our memory and our intuitiveness right here on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Jim Carroll, our guest tonight, and we'll take your phone calls. And I'll tell you what, you can be part of uh, this uh, learning curve that Jim is going to teach us. You can just ask him a question if you want about magic or mind, and uh, just I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to just do what you want to do when you call in, because this is, this is fascinating. Why do people love magic, Jim? I mean, absolutely love magic. Yeah, is it because when we were kids... Everybody, geez, I, I know. It's, since we're kids, yeah, everybody just loves magic. They, you know what? Everybody, they're, they're, that's why everybody loves this show. That they're, they're, they're thrilled with anything mysterious. That they don't have the the, the exact answer. How's how's it done? You know, are aliens real? Is this you know? It, it's the, the mystery of it. I guess that's what we love. Everybody loves the mystery of it. Everybody loves to be fooled too. And uh, and you know, you could you could perform. For elementary school kids, you could perform for doctors and lawyers, policemen, prisoners in a, in a, in a prison, college, everybody, senior citizens, everybody loves it. I mean, no, no matter what walk of life, there's, I mean, there are people that don't like it either, but 
but most of them like it. Yeah, but you know what? If if somebody watches a great magic trick and doesn't smile or laugh or, or just scratch their head, there's something wrong with them. Yeah, I love magic. I, I love all the guys. So many great magicians out here. I love, I love like, Copperfield's fantastic. Penn and Teller are different. They're cool. I like that kind of stuff. Yeah. They're, they're a little different. They're a little out there, but that's, that's I like that kind of stuff. Make the amazing Jonathan in Vegas. Oh, my. So many great magicians out here, and it's... I, I think I got into the best hobby in the world. And <laughs> you now turned I it into an evocation. Yeah, it's amazing. I do not like clown magicians. <laughs> got a little hang-up about that. Yeah, clowns. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of clowns. I don't know. You are, too? Yeah. <laughs> I don't... Have you been in an event and there's, my... a, and there's a clown there? No, you know, the thing is my, my, my oldest boy is 